Hi everyone, welcome to a psych. I'm Miss M and I have been away for a while. So we had the holidays, my husband and I and our family are expecting in July. So it's kind of been a gnarly couple months. Um, my eyes finally back to normal, it was all bloodshot. You know, the whole morning sickness thing. And if you don't, there you go. So um, I feel really drawn to make this video and talk about Baron Cohen. So that's what we're gonna do today. Um, I'm actually only going to tell you the really important things that you need to know about it because there's a lot of numbers and a lot of material in Baron Cohen. So stick with me and uh, I'll get you through it, okay? Okay, so the background of Baron Cohen, we are talking about autism. Now, originally Baron Cohen had done his study um, in 1997 and it did have some people with um, Tourette syndrome in it. So if you do read a study and it's does contain those types of people in its sample, then um, you're actually reading the 1997 version. And this is really important that you um, do understand the 1997 version of this because a lot of what I'm gonna go over um, in a little bit of uh, the end of the background information is the fact that he is trying to prove the reliability of this um, reading of the mind's eyes test. It's something that he created. So. This first version, um, it's kind of his baby, and then um, this 2001 version that we are studying in the 9990 syllabus, this is the one we are actually being tested on. But, um, you know, as there are important things with some studies, for this study, what's important is knowing um, what was wrong with the original study or the problems that were found, and then how we fix them. Okay, so let's just start off with what autism is. So, in the past, um, we have uh, PPD, we have Asperger's syndrome, we have all these names for um, these kind of little tidbits of what we now call ASD, which is Autism Spectrum Disorder, um, and it and is what it is. If you think about a spectrum of 0 to 50, or even if you want to think 0 to 100, um, somewhere on that spectrum, people fall, and there's really no predictability yet about where or how this happens. Um, there is a lot of research that's being done, and so far, current research, um, what we found out is that people who are, are born, children that are born with autism, what is happening is that they have this overabundance of neurons that are being produced um, in you know the, the frontal lobe of their brain, and that is actually, you know, those neurons are supposed to uh, begin their connections in the second trimester of you know prenatal life so our research is heading in that direction of what is occurring you know in that second trimester that is um, maybe changing the biology of the mother um, some connection to why there is this overproduction of neurons and um, with the overproduction of neurons those neurons produce um, dopamine and norepinephrine which you know control emotion and and feelings and and energy levels and sensitivities to things. So um, there's that connection with uh, where is autism coming from? I know in the past we, you know, even when I was studying um, autism with my behavioral master's degree, they, um, you know, there were still theories of, of shots, medical shots causing it. Um, but, you know, there's just that correlation between the time that we were discovering autism in children and the time that they get their shots around age of three. So what's really important to know is this theory of mind is the ability for yourself to be put in somebody else's shoes and, and feel empathy for, for them or um, understand their situation based on what they've gone through um, or emotions that they've, they've felt. So you're able to feel them and understand. So um, there's this thing called the Sally Ann test and look it up on YouTube, watch it. I won't explain the whole video. Um, but basically they, they take three and four year olds and they, and they say that theory of mind develops somewhere between three and four. And, um, here's an example. When my son Stone was, I think he was uh, maybe like two and a half, three, just turning three. Um, and I would say, Hey Stone, can you pass the salt at dinner time? Um, he would just like say, yep. And like keep eating. And <laughs> because he's taking it literally, I'm, yes, I'm able to pass the salt mom. Um, he is now able to put himself in my shoes and, and say, oh, wait, she's asking me for the salt because she needs it for her food because we're eating dinner. So, um, but my four-year-old, Kala, was definitely able to, 
you know, turn around and, and give me the salt. And you can try this if you know any three or four year olds. Um, it's kind of a fun little test to do. So Sally Ann test, look it up on YouTube. Okay. So, um, let's talk about the background information of this 1997 version and this 2001 version. Okay. So I might do this a little bit differently because, um, I'm just going to tell you what's, what these problems were, how we solved it. And then I'm going to tell you maybe like two or three that you're going to want to hold on to for the test. Okay. So, um, in the original version, we had a forced choice. So that's just like A or B. So if you don't choose, you know, if you're, you're either right or you're wrong, 50, 50 shot. So, um, you know, the, the performance level was, you know, kind of all over the place in, in this. There was no significance to it. There was no um, greater or lesser in, in certain areas. Parents were scoring the same as their kids were. So how did we change this? Well, we increased um, our options from two choices to four choices. So basically, if they got a score of 13 out of 36, which is like 30, uh, 36%, um, was significant. So um, let's see. There were only 25 initially. So um, questions. So we raised that number to 36. Um, some items were too easy for people to understand, like just using words of happy, sad, angry, and, you know, typically those are words and emotions that little kids can understand. So we used more complex mental states in, um, in the actual study. And something else that we changed is by adding these complex mental states is we added a dictionary. So we allowed our participants to look in the dictionary to look up these words. Um... The original test had more female faces than males, so obviously what did we do? We got more male faces. Um, the original study had semantic opposites, um, so remember it had two choices. So most of the time the choices would be complete opposites, like happy and sad. So if you didn't get, you know, if the person definitely didn't look upset in any way, then you would pick happy and you would be correct. Um, and that caused what is known as a ceiling effect. So if you think about like a ceiling um, in your house and the floor, um, so the ceiling is a 100 and the floor is a zero. Um, so a ceiling effect is when everybody gets all the answers right. So it's like a teacher makes a test too easy. Um, and then a floor effect is when, um, you know, everybody's, nobody's getting it right. And, you know, that could be if a teacher makes a test too difficult or maybe they test for material that wasn't taught in the classroom um, or in the book. So, um, the three that I would hold on to that are really easy to understand and the ones that are easy for me to remember are the fact that we had two words originally and we changed that to four, that we had semantic opposites. So happy, sad, um, and we changed that. We got rid of it. So actually three of the words were similar and then one was like completely different just so we didn't have complete opposites. Um, and then the male and the female faces. So um, just remember that we just corrected it by adding an even, even amount. Okay, so let's get on to the aim and the hypothesis and, you know, all that stuff within the experiment. Okay, so let's go through um, the aims and the methods. So Baron Cohen's study, it's important to know that there were three aims and there were five hypotheses. And if you can remember that an aim is just a statement of what we want to see and then a hypothesis is basically a predictable aim. So he took these three and broke them down into statements that we can say we either prove or disprove. Okay, so um, the first one was we wanted to just basically test a, a group of autistic adults to see if the revised eyes version worked, because remember he did one version in 1997. Um, we want to see if there is an inverse correlation between the eyes and the AQ test um, for normal adults. So remember the AQ is autism quotient, um, and you can look that up and you can take that yourself. Um, I think I got a score of like 11 most every time that I scored on that test. Um, here's a hint. If uh, you score somewhere between, um, you know, one and 25, that's a completely normal score. Uh, for men, it seems that a higher score of like 25 to 28 or in, somewhere in the 30s is still acceptable. Um, low 30s, I would say is high functioning autism. And then once you get to like 50, that would be like a low functioning autism. Um, but don't diagnose yourself. That's just kind of 
you know, something fun that you can do to experience, to put yourself in the shoes of the sample. Okay. So in that third aim is to see if females have superiority in the eyes test. So basically, um, you'll see in the hypothesis, we're basically just going to break that aim down um, into, you know, two different hypotheses. Okay. okay. So our first group is the ASHFA, high functioning autistic group. Um, we will see them score lower on the eyes test than other groups. And the eyes test is measuring theory of mind. So it makes sense that we want to see those with autism, they're going to score lower. And someone who does not have autism will be able to see empathy and feel empathy and communicate empathy and they should score a little bit higher on there. So um, the autistic group will score higher on the AQ test than other groups. That's also kind of an obvious thing because if you have autism, if you're labeled that you have autism, then you've probably taken this test and you probably already have a number that scored high. So um, we're probably going to predict to see those with autism score higher on the AQ than the, any normal male or female groups. So um, number three, the normal female will score higher than males on the eyes test. So, you know, for theories say that females are better at feeling empathy and they are better at speaking and displaying empathy. Um, I think we can relate to the Canley when we pick females for that. Um, so we just believe, or Baron Cohen believes, that females overall will score higher on the um, reading of the mind's eyes test um, than males. So um, normal males will score higher than females on the AQ. So let's go back to that first, the third aim, I'm sorry, where he says, um, or the second aim, the inverse correlation. So those predictions of three and four are basically that one aim. So he's saying if the females will score higher on the eyes test, then the males will score higher on the AQ test. So therefore there will be an inverse correlation because males will score lower on the theory of mind um, and females will score lower on the AQ. So uh, they're basically saying that the higher your score is on the AQ, the more autistic you are uh, labeled, then the lower score you will have on the theory of mind. You won't do so well on it. But if you do really, really well on the theory of mind, then your autism score should be really low. Okay, that's the inverse or a negative correlation. Negative correlation, put that in your head, be able to explain it, it's really important, okay? Um, and that last hypothesis is scores on the AQ and the eyes test will be inverse, inversely correlated. So it's just kind of throwing that back one in there. Um, at the end of the day, remember that all five of these were uh, proven correct. Okay, so try to, um, you know, at least be able to identify two or three of these hypotheses for the exam. Okay, so um, our methods, we have a natural experiment and it's a questionnaire. So a majority of this study is going to be in the numbers and the data in the questionnaire. No one's really performing um, an experiment or acting out or there's observations. There's none of that here. Um, most of the work here comes before, okay, with our groups of people. So um, let's uh, break down our sample and uh, look at these groups that we have. Okay, so it's important to know that um, we're basically taking and experimenting on a group of autistic adults, which were all male. Um, and I believe that it was a self-selected sample because the participants read an ad in an autistic magazine and then they um, responded to the ad to be part of this experiment. So um, we have four groups and it's basically the autistic group versus um, our, a bunch of control groups. Um, and that last control group is actually our matched pairs group. So um, our group one uh, consisted of 15 males and they were all diagnosed with either um, Asperger's syndrome or high functioning autism. And, um, you know, like I said before, we consider them volunteers because they found their ad in a autistic society magazine in the UK and they answered the ad and now they're part of the experiment. So um, in group two were 122 normal adults and they were just recruited from the community around the area um, so that's going to be an opportunity sample. Our third group consisted of 103 normal adults. They were 53 males and 50 males, and they were all undergraduate students at the at Cambridge University. Um, here's some statistics. 71 were science majors, 32 were in all other subjects, 
And um, this was the only group that was not tested for IQ because we just assumed that because they went to Cambridge University that they all had high IQs. So remember that. The Cambridge group, which was number three, this was not tested um, for AQ, uh, for, I'm sorry, for the IQ. And um, the second group, which was the uh, normal adults from the community, they were actually not tested for the AQ. Okay, so remember that. So this fourth group, um, this is a matched pairs group. And if you can remember, the matched pairs is so that we can rule out some type of variable. So what we did was we randomly selected um, 14 of the adults in the normal group, normal group that were tested for IQ. And um, we randomly selected some that ha that basically contain an average um, IQ of, I think it was like 115. And then the autistic group's average IQ was 116. So we tried to match them for IQ Basically, so at the end of the day, we can say that intelligence is not a factor in these in these tests or in these um, questionnaires that we're giving our participants. Okay, so let's go over that really quickly again. Uh, group one, autistic group. Uh, gr group two was the general community. Um, no test for AQ on that group. Group three, we have our Cambridge students. They were already known to have a high IQ, so we did not test them for IQ. And that fourth is the matched pairs group. And we were trying to match their IQ to the first group, which was somewhere around 115, 116 for their IQ. Okay. So let's go over what the AQ in the, in the eyes test actually were, um, because our participants, you know, we couldn't we had to give them some direction. We couldn't exactly tell them what we were looking for, but we had to give them some direction. So um, put yourself in the shoes of the uh, participant and um, I'm going to explain the eyes test to you a little bit. So um, imagine looking at a flat black and white two dimensional picture of someone's eyes, just their eyes, just this. Okay. I think some might've contained noses, but most were just eyes. Um, and there were 36 of these photos and male, female faces. Um, and then under each face had four words for you to choose from. Um, and then you were basically asked which word describes this person's face the best or their eyes the best. And if you didn't know some of the words, you were given a dictionary. Um, and then you were able to go through basically all 36 to, um, you know, find out which answers are correct. Um, there was only one that was correct. Other three were not correct. Remember, we called those uh, foils or fake answers. Um, <clears throat> so originally, when we did this study, this this was 2001, there were 40. Um, but then we went through it and found that, that four of them were not really reliable. So we took them out. So we ended up with 36 um, photos of people's eyes for the eyes test. Now, the AQ test... Um, this consists of 50 statements that people have to either say agree or disagree. Um, and you can't opt out, so you can't really get a zero on it. I know that's hard, but um, basically you're simply given one point if you say agree and half a point if you say disagree. So no matter what, you, you can't score You can't score really, really, really low to the point of a zero because you have 50 questions. So, um, this is also called the psychometric test. Um, this and the theory of mind. So psychometric tests are tests that measure things we can't see, measure our mind, like personality, IQ, um, this autism quotient, um, empathy. Okay. So when, um, you're measuring things that you can't see like that, we call those psychometric tests. Okay, so if you look at your book or you look at the original study, you're going to see so many numbers. Don't worry about those numbers. Those are not that important. What I'm going to give you is what is important for numbers for your results, okay? Um, but remember, results and conclusions are different. Conclusions are statements made from our numbers. So um, let's go over some of these results. So in the autism group, which is group one, we have the eyes test. Okay, in the eyes test, the, the mean score was a 21.9. And then on the AQ, theirs was a 34.4. .4. OK, 
Okay, so you can see that they scored um, pretty high on the autism quotient, but they didn't score that high on the eyes test. Uh, general population, 26.2 on the eyes test. Um, and remember, they didn't take the AQ. Um, students uh, from Cambridge, they had a 28 on the eyes test and an 18.3 on the AQ test. So they were like kind of the comp the opposite of the AQ test. But remember, we, we didn't break this down into males and females yet. It's just, just the group. Um, but these results are important for this match pairs group here. Okay, so um, match pairs group scored a 30.9 on the eyes test. So they scored the highest out of out of all of them. Um, and the AQ test was an 18.9. So it wasn't exactly the lowest because the students scored lower there, but they were um, basically the complete opposite of that first group, which goes to show that there's no intelligence needed. Um, because I mean, they scored higher on the theory of mind than the Cambridge students did. What does that say? Um, okay, so um, what did we prove here? All right, let's go over the conclusions. Okay, so I'm going to read you a couple of the findings that are going to be important for you to draw conclusions about what this test is really about. Okay, so um, it is important to know that the mean score for the eyes test um, for group one was a 21.9. So they did, in fact, score the lowest on the eyes test. Okay. Um, and for that, that was the first prediction. Um, so first hypothesis, uh, proven correct. Um, so the sex differences on the eyes test were examined in groups two and three. So in the Cambridge and the general population, we took the males and the females and we separated their scores. And we did find that females scored higher um, on the eyes test and that males did score higher on the AQ test. So um, that basically predor per bleh. <laughs> that basically predict uh, supports our prediction number three where we, we thought females would score higher. It supports our prediction number four where we thought males would score higher on the AQ and number five where we find this negative correlation um, because overall, I mean, there was a significance of a p-score of um, 0.004, um, which is in, it's going to show this negative correlation um, between the AQ and the eyes test. So um, again, a negative correlation just means that as uh, it's kind of like polar opposites. As one thing goes up, the other is kind of pushing down. It has to go down. It doesn't, uh, positive correlation is when two things move in the same direction, whether they're going forwards, backwards, right, left, same direction. But um, a negative correlation is complete opposite, okay? So um, if you're gonna, let's just say on a scale of zero to 100, if you score um, a 100 on the theory of mind, then you're gonna probably score like a one or a zero on the autism quotient. And if you score in the 50, high 50, um, sorry, high 40s, 50 range on the AQ, you're gonna score in the, you know, low tens or so maybe on the theory of mind. So that negative correlation is really important to understand. Um, so we did prove all our predictions correct. So the autism group did score the lowest out of all in the theory of mind. They did also score the highest in the AQ. Um, our females did score higher in the theory of mind and our males did score higher than females in the autism quotient. Um, and then at the end of the day, our p-value showed that we did find a negative correlation in our numbers. So that just means um, that anyone who takes the test per se, not anyone, but a um, majority of the people that take this test, if you take both tests, you know, your score will be predictable. If you score high on one, then we can predict you will score low on the other and vice versa. Okay. Okay, so let's do a quick evaluation of the study. We're going to use G-R-A-V-E, our grave. Um, <clears throat> so generalizability. Who are we generalizing this to? We do have participants who have autism, so um, we can generalize it to only males who have autism. Remember, there's only males in this study. There is not one female with autism. So um, only males with autism. It was also only done in the UK, so remember that. Uh, we don't have anything on their ethnicity or their skin color, um, 
we did have a really good mix of males and females from general population and those uh, Cambridge. So I will say that we could probably generalize that negative correlation to a majority of the population. Okay, so uh, reliability. That was this whole study is we are trying to prove that that this theory of mind, um, this theory of reading the mind's eyes test, that this is um, a reliable test. And we did prove that by getting better scores and, um, you know, tweaking some things in this second one. So remember that background information about what was wrong with the first study and how we fixed it. That is going to help with this reliability question. So you can throw some of those in there. Remember the key ones, the semantic opposites, the male and female faces, um, and that there were only two force choice. So we added four. Okay. Um, application. How do we apply this to the real world? Well, autism is, is such a spectrum and it also accompanies other uh, disorders of, of some type. You know, there's, it's usually just not, hey, you're diagnosed with ASD. There's some other sensitive disorder or, or mental development. There's something else in there. So um, to say that, that we can generalize autism is, well, you can't generalize autism. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's why we have a spectrum. And using these tests in a clinical sense, I would say um, it, it's good application. How can we use this in the real world? Well, you know, if we see that there is a child that lacks empathy in some way, um, maybe we, that's a hint that there's some, some autism there because you know, I truly believe that there are people in the world that are not diagnosed as autism or high functioning autism, but they might display some of those qualities. Um, and we also have, you know, males who somehow display a higher level of those types of characteristics than females do. They call it the gynocentric. So, um, again, application, how do we apply this to the real world? In a clinical sense, yes. Um, I don't believe that just average people should be fooling around with this and trying to diagnose people, but you can use it for your own children maybe uh, and then go to a doctor afterwards. Validity. The big one here is ecological validity. Are we measuring what we intended to measure? Is it valid information? So we are trying to measure emotion, empathy, through someone's eyes. Now, let's just say, do you normally tell how people feel just by this portion of their face? You don't see the rest of their body. You don't see their body language. You don't see the way their mouth moves. Maybe the, you know, movement, any movement, the movement true, right? You don't just stand there too flat, 2D, flat, black and white, dimensional. Did I even say that right? Two dimensional, flat, black and white piece of paper of someone's eyes. And you're supposed to tell how emotion, what emotion they're feeling. Okay, so um, at the end of the day, remember that some part of this had a bias in it. Someone who created this had a bias. Okay, the they chose these photos for a reason. I, I don't know why, but there was a reason for choosing the photos. It wasn't like there were a hundred pictures and then we had a hundred students choose the ones that they thought best describe emotion or that they could, um, you know, describe the motion the best in or were the best eyes for the job. I don't know. Um, so. Uh, ethics. Now, I don't believe that we breached ethics anywhere. It was a simple questionnaire. Um, there were no demand characteristics that we can talk about. So ethics are pretty good on this. So where you're going to have some answering is in the reliability and the application and the validity, specifically the validity. Uh, and remember that we only have male subjects in the autistic group. So we can't, you know, diagnose um, outside or say that this is generalizable to females with autism. Okay. So, um, I hope we hit all the key points in this. If you're wondering why I didn't go too in depth of, um, all those numbers and details, again, remember those five hypotheses. Remember we proved them all. Okay. Remember that negative correlation. Um, talk about the background information. Uh, what is autism? We're still studying that. So um, Baron Cohen is, a, you know, the, the forerunner in this. Uh, he's, he kind of started the, all the hype in the research. So um, I, that's why I love this, having this study in the syllabus. Um, all right. Again, I am Miss M. <clears throat> if you need some extra help on this, I have a Google Classroom that has a bunch of information. So if you don't have a textbook, you're doing this on your own, um, send me an email at hpsychology9990 at gmail.com. 
and um, I'll just invite you to the classroom. Uh, you can also follow me on Instagram. I throw some videos up there from time to time. Uh, throw a comment below if there's something specific you needed to know about Baron Cohen. I can just write the answer there for you. All right, so have a great day, guys.